Welcome back to Chem 131A. Today we're going to pick up where we left off last time. We're going to continue our exposition of a particle on a sphere, which is going to be our entree into the theory of angular momentum that later on we're going to use when we talk about real atoms. Today then, particle on a sphere and angular momentum. Remember that we had our separated equations. We had, by dividing by the product of theta of theta and phi of phi, we ended up with a sum of several terms. One of the terms only has phi and the function of phi, and the other has only theta. And therefore, by the same arguments that we used in the two-dimensional particle in a box, we can separate the um, solutions and deal with them separately. And that's, of course, a very important simplification because that lets us deal with just a function of one variable and regular derivatives. Uh, so let's look at the first term then. The first term has 1 over phi of phi times the second derivative. And that term is exactly like the solution we had for the particle on a ring. So this shows the wisdom of doing the particle on a ring first because now we simply recognize that we've basically got the same situation all over again and we don't actually have to solve it. Uh, we anticipate that we're going to have a quantization condition because we know that we have some sort of a bound system and we saw before that we had a quantum number m that I called the magnetic quantum number. We'll see why in a minute. And now I'm going to call this new number m sub l to keep track of the fact that m may depend on something else. And of course, since I already know the solution, I can seem to be rather prescient about what notation to pick. But anyway, the differential equation then, the eigenvalue equation, is that the second derivative of phi of phi is equal to some constant minus m sub l squared times phi of phi. And here m sub l is a positive or negative integer and it could even be zero just like it was for the particle on a ring. So our solution then is going to be uh, e to the i m phi and uh, I won't bother normalizing the eigenfunction because we'll normalize the whole uh, eigenfunction over the entire sphere at the end. But we know that this makes sense and this is basically what we saw the, for the particle on a ring. The other uh, part then, if this first part sums to minus ml squared, then the other part must sum to plus ml squared, where ml is an integer. So we have this rather in, uh, in, uh, intimidating, I guess, uh, differential equation in theta with sine theta and the derivative of the function theta uh, plus epsilon sine squared theta is equal to m sub l squared. And at this point, <clears throat> the text, in my opinion, kind of dodges everything and just says, well, mathematicians seem to know how to solve this kind of equation. And uh, while that's true, I'd like to do a little bit of guesswork as to how we might try to solve this kind of equation and see if we can get a little bit more insight into what the solutions are looking like by trying to do it. And one way to try to do it is to say, well, um, maybe it's sort of like a particle on a ring again and to try similar kinds of things. And that would make sense because we have trigonometric functions in this differential equation. And so it probably uh, is true that the solution is also going to have trigonometric functions in. And because we have this sphere, this round thing, we expect that the wave function will have some periodicity with respect to theta like it does with respect to phi. And that's another argument as to why we could do that. So rather than simply quoting all the results and giving them in a table and leaving you none the wiser, as they say, I'd like to go through just a little bit of, of the thinking behind it. And so let's 
go back then to the original equation which had both theta and phi in and we have an idea what we're going to have for uh, the phi part and we want to see what we're going to have for the theta part. To simplify the notation I'm going to kind of go backwards and not write it as uh, explicit product anymore but I'm going to adopt the notation that's actually used for the solution which is uh, YLM of theta phi and that makes the equations easier to fit on the slides as well. Therefore what we've got now is minus h bar squared over 2mr squared 1 over sine squared the second derivative of YLM with respect to phi plus 1 over sine theta dd theta sine theta the, sec uh, the first derivative of YLM with respect to theta, that should equal some energy as yet to be determined, which we expect is going to depend on L and M, and we'll see what they are in a second. M we know, L we don't. Again, times YLM. And the key is we have to get an energy that is independent of the variables theta and phi. If the energy is some variable function, then we haven't solved the eigenvalue equation. We just have to get some constant, some number, and then look at it and see if we've got it right. Uh, M was zero, uh, was one of the solutions for the particle on a ring, just flat probability all around. And so I could try just using a constant for YLM and have a look at that and see if that might actually solve this particular differential equation. And if we assume that the uh, m part has to do with the z component of the angular momentum, that's true because the angular momentum follows uh, the r cross p rule, and so we, we know that if it's going around in a ring in the xy plane, which is what we had for the variable phi, that it's really the z component of angular momentum, then it makes sense that the rest of the stuff has to do with the x and the y components of the angular momentum. Those must be in there. And the question is, could those uh, be zero as well? If we pick a constant and there's no curvature anywhere, then the energy is going to be zero. So we try it, and we call it y0,0, zero, zero, because whatever powers uh, in L we have, potentially, we're setting them constant, which is the same as raising them to the zero power. And M we know is zero. That was the constant solution for the particle on a ring. So then we just put y0,0 zero, zero of theta phi is just equal to some constant. We don't know what the constant is because we haven't normalized the wave function. Um, if we normalize the wave function uh, to get the constant, we just put in y0,0 zero, zero, square modulus, and then we have to integrate over phi from 0 to 2 pi. That's around the ring. And then we have to integrate theta, but we have to remember when we integrate theta to remember to look back to the volume element for spherical polar coordinates and include sine theta. So we uh, integrate sine theta d theta from 0 to pi. And if we do that, we find we get 4 pi times y0,0 zero, zero squared is equal to 1. And neglecting the phase, which we usually choose to be just real, y0,0 zero, zero, theta phi should just be the constant 1 over the square root of 4 pi. Um, and as I, as I remarked, don't forget the sine theta when you do these integrals. It's easy to do so if you aren't actually looking at the volume element and just deciding to integrate to normalize the function. If you do that, you get another factor of pi, and everything gets all crossed up. In this case, for a constant, the angular energy is zero because if we put a constant in and we take the derivative with respect to phi, we get zero. And if we take the derivative again, we get zero. And uh, same with theta, we get zero. So we just get zero for everything. For an atom in this state, which we'll see later is called S, which has to do with some historical 
observations in atomic spectroscopy that I'll explain. The energy, the energy of the atom must be in the radial part because remember when we converted the kinetic energy for the particle on a sphere, we threw away the radial part. We just said, oh well, we're, we're dealing with a particle on a sphere here and we're going to throw away the radial part because R is fixed. And of course, that the same reason why that's an artificial thing to do with the particle on a ring, although it simplifies the problem, is an artificial thing to do here. So we don't worry too much about um, that the energy is zero and that means that the uncertainty principle would, would be violated if we uh, believe that because we couldn't have any fluctuation in kinetic, uh, the square of the kinetic energy then or we would have some sort of energy because that's a positive number. Now, uh, we have no idea other than this argument that a constant seems to work, what might work for the other solutions in theta. But what we can do is we can just try the same thing that we tried with phi. We could try e to the i theta and see what happens if we try that. And I will let you do that as an interesting problem try putting in e to the i theta and see what comes out. And usually what you can find out is that you get something close to what you want, but it's not quite what you want. It has some extra parts, and then usually by inspecting those you can get an idea of what to throw away. That's in fact what I did on the side on a, on a piece of paper, and then I decided I should try just cosine theta. Let's stick with phi as a constant. Let's try cosine theta for the theta dependence. That's a function that has a node and uh, therefore we would expect that that would be sort of giving us some angular momentum in the x and y uh, components because now we have some curvature with respect to theta along that direction. If we put that in, and uh, that's going to actually be called y10 when we finally get done with figuring out what the proper notation is for these functions. For now, we just put it in and we set up our eigenvalue equation. Same thing, second derivative with respect to phi, 1 over the sine squared theta, and so forth, and the funny derivative with respect to theta that we're going to work through. Now we just uh, put through cosine theta, since there's no phi dependence at all, uh, that partial derivative vanishes. and We just uh, can throw that part out. And we have minus h bar squared over 2mr squared, 1 over sine theta, d by d theta, sine theta, d uh, cosine theta, d theta and that should be equal to e, what we're going to call e10, cosine theta, because we have to replicate the function that we put in. Uh, the derivative uh, with respect uh, of the cosine with respect to theta is minus the sine. If we then in the next line uh, take the derivative of minus sine squared theta, that's minus u squared, and uh, the rule is minus 2u du dx, and so therefore I get minus 2 sine theta cosine theta. And now, magically, the 1 over sine theta that was out in front on this term cancels the sine theta that I got by taking the derivative of sine squared theta and I just end up with cosine theta and the minus sign cancels the minus sign on the h bar squared which is good because I want a positive energy and I end up with 2 h bar squared over 2 m r squared cosine theta which is 2 h bar squared over 2 i cosine theta and that's equal to e10 cosine theta and therefore I figured out what the energy of this um, state is that's cosine theta and nothing in phi. It's an eigenfunction 
and the eigenenergy is 2h bar squared over 2 times the moment of inertia, capital I. I should be careful to say capital I so that you don't think it's the square root of minus 1. Good. Um, but that's just, again, one solution. We're sort of in the situation we were with the harmonic oscillator that we could get the ground state um, by arguing, well, it should be something related to an exponential. We try e to the x, no good, and then we do a Gaussian, and bingo, it works. Here, um, we tried cosine theta, and it worked, and what we could do then is uh, try sine theta, because cosine theta and sine theta are closely related. Both have similar curvature, and uh, let's Let's look at this, then, and try uh, sine theta. But first, let's normalize this wave function, cosine theta. That's kind of a good exercise, because we have to do those integrals. And if we do the integrals, we have to integrate over, over d phi. Cosine squared, because remember, we have to take the wave function and square it before we integrate it. And we do the integral with respect to phi, and we just get 2 pi, because there's no phi, uh, function of phi, in there. And then the sine theta for the volume element is out in front, so now we have an integral to do, the integral from 0 to pi of cos squared theta sine theta d theta. And we can look up that integral, or we can uh, work it out by the substitution uh, u is equal to cosine theta. And if we do that, we find that that integral is equal to 2 thirds. And so we have 2 pi from the phi part and 2 thirds uh, from the theta part. That should equal to 1, and therefore the constant out front should be the square root of 3 upon 4 pi. That's our final solution then for another energy eigenfunction that we hadn't seen, and uh, we call it y10 because L is 1 for this. What if we try sine theta? Well, it's, it's kind of a good thing to just try it and see what happens. And here's what happens. If we try sine theta, we then have for the, the term, the chain term, the derivative of sine theta with respect to theta, that's cosine theta. So then we have the derivative with respect to theta of sine theta times cosine theta. We do, that's a product, so that's the derivative of the first times the second, which is cosine squared theta, plus the second times the derivative of the first, which is minus sine squared theta. And we end up with these two terms, and now there's no cancellation. We have minus h bar squared over 2mr squared, 1 over sine theta, cosine squared theta minus sine squared theta, and that should be equal to e, some constant, times sine theta. That cannot possibly be true because we have this cos squared and sine squared and they aren't canceling out. And so that cannot possibly be true for a constant e when theta is varying. Therefore, we have to think, well, how can we sort of make up for this? And the only way to make up for this is to have some other part come in from the derivative with respect to phi. But that means that we have to put in something for the phi part that gives a non-zero derivative. Well, we know what we're going to put in for the phi part. We're going to put in e to the i m phi. And the easiest one to try is m is equal to 1, since m is equal to 0 was this one, and this one didn't work. So we put in, as our second attempt, e to the i phi times sine theta. And we put that in. Now, uh, the, the uh, second term gives exactly the same thing as before, except there's another term, um, e to the i phi, riding along. So I don't have to do all those derivatives over. I can just write down 1 over sine theta cos squared theta minus sine squared theta. 
all times e to the i phi, and then there's some constants out in front. Now, however, for the phi part, the second derivative, I get something because I have a phi in there, and that actually comes to the rescue. So recall, that part is the same constant, 1 over sine squared theta times the second derivative with respect to phi of sine theta e to the i phi. The second derivative of that is i squared times e to the i phi because I just bring down the constant. Whether it's a real number or an imaginary number, it does not matter in the slightest. I bring down the same constant, multiply it, and I follow the rules. i squared is equal to minus 1. Great, perfect. That gets rid of the minus sign on the h bar squared, so that's out of my hair. And what I end up with then, because of the 1 over sine squared theta out in front, is I end up with h bar squared over 2mr squared times 1 over sine theta times e to the i phi. And now there's a trick, and the trick um, Oftentimes in these eigenvalue equations, there is a trick. And until you see the trick, you don't think of it. Because I've got one, one is a simple thing, but one could be written in many, many different ways. And the trick is to figure out how to write one in a way that's useful to add to the other term. Since the other term has cos squared theta and sine squared theta, and I know that cos squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to 1, that's what I'm going to use. So in the last line on this slide 293, I've written h bar squared over 2mr squared times cos squared theta plus sine squared theta divided by sine theta times e to the i phi. If we add the two terms up, we had cos squared theta minus sine squared theta over sine theta, and then cos squared theta plus sine squared theta over sine theta. And so we end up, the cos squared goes away, and the sine squared adds up, and therefore we end up with 2 sine squared theta divided by sine theta. And then, bingo, we end up with the same function that we had namely 2h bar squared over 2mr squared sine theta e to the i phi is equal to the energy times sine theta times e to the i phi. Well, that's perfect because that means that the energy has to be that constant, 2h bar squared over 2mr squared. And interestingly enough, that's the same energy as we got when we used cosine theta. So it seems like, at first blush, the power in theta has something to do with the eigenvalue for the energy that we get, and that's in fact going to be true. We have the exact same energy, and so that means that this system has degeneracy. And recall, degeneracy is often related to symmetry when we had the particle in a box, we had degeneracy when the two dimensions had the same size. And in this case, we could imagine that all we're doing is swapping around whether we have uh, the z component of the angular momentum or the x or y component of the angular momentum. And they would have the same energy, but they would just be rotating about a different axis classically, and they would be rotating at the same rate. So that seems okay, uh, and that's not troublesome. Another equally valid choice, which won't surprise you if you can pick e to the i phi, is that you can pick e to the minus i phi, again, times sine theta. And that also has the same energy, and we'll call that one E1 minus 1. So we have E1, 1, E1, 0, and E1 minus 1. And there are no other ones. If we try sine theta or cos theta with E to the 2 i phi, we end up with a mess. So therefore, those are the three. We know it has to be integer, so those are the three. And we start to see a pattern. 
for the bottom one where the theta parts are constant, we end up with one function in phi which is also a constant, m is equal to zero. For the next one where we have some trig functions in theta that are raised to the first power, sine theta and cosine theta, then we have three values of phi. We have one, zero, and minus one. And so it looks like the values of m are bounded by the value of l. And that would make sense because l is going to turn out to be the square of the total angular momentum and m has to do with just the z component and the z component of angular momentum, whatever it is, can't exceed the total of all of them and so it would have to be bounded by them. And of course they come in units of h bar, uh, each of them. So L squared comes in units of h bar squared, LZ squared comes in units of h bar squared, and LZ, LX and LY come in units of just h bar. The, uh, so the solutions have two times h bar squared over two i. And the second powers in theta, if we pick cos squared and cosine sine and sine squared, not surprisingly, there are five values of m that go with that, two, one, zero, minus one, and minus two. And those are the uh, five, and so we see a pattern, one, three, five, and that pattern continues. And in general, there are always two L plus values of M that are possible to choose where L is the highest power um, in the trig functions that you pick for theta. Now without some uh, more powerful methods to analyze the equation, it's going to take us forever to play around and guess different kinds of functions um, in theta that happen to work and it could be a, an extremely frustrating thing like doing a crossword puzzle rather than doing mathematics where you just knock it out. But for, for us at this point, we aren't going to uh, go into the theory of differential equations to such a depth because it's going to pull us too far afield and that would be a proper course to take in math. But I think you can see why such a course is incredibly valuable because if you come up against equations like this, um, you're either forced to sort of uh, type, henpeck your way through the equations, which can be good if you only want a few solutions, but it's very slow, or you can be sort of become the master of how to figure out these equations and move a lot more quickly. Of course, it takes time to learn how to type, and it takes time to learn how to approach these kinds of problems in a sophi more sophisticated way so that you actually can get all the solutions and not have to spend a ton of time writing them down. Therefore, uh, we can um, generalize this um, in the light of the pattern and we can say, look, the energy ELM is equal to L times L plus one times H bar squared over two capital I, the moment of inertia. And classically, the uh, energy of a rotating body is just L squared over two I, where L is again the square, uh, L squared is the square of the angular momentum. And therefore, what we can associate then is that the square of the angular momentum in the case of a quantum object, particle on a sphere, is now quantized in units of h bar. And that's perfect because that's exactly what we expect. The funny thing about it is that rather than just L squared times h bar squared, little l squared, we get L times L plus one. We couldn't tell any difference if L is zero between L squared and L times L plus one. But when L is one, when we have some angular momentum, there is a difference. And there's this extra plus one, and as we shall see, that actually has something to do with the uncertainty principle. It just came in out of the equation here, but it also is very closely related 
to the fact that there has to be some wobble that we, we couldn't actually have all the angular momentum be along z. If we could have it all be along z and there were nothing left over, then there wouldn't be any uncertainty in any of the three. z would be known and lx and ly would also be zero because the square would have to add up. And to make sure that doesn't happen, we have an extra plus one that comes in conveniently, another unit of h-bar, that even when z is as big as it can possibly be, the top value of m, there's still a little extra. So there's still a little wobble left, and that is exactly in accordance with the uncertainty principle. These functions, ylm, are well known, as our textbook says, and they're called the spherical harmonics. And uh, you can look them up and you can read all about them. They come in from all kinds of uh, differential equations when you take the divergence of the gradient of a scalar field, you end up with these kinds of functions. But as far as we're concerned, just like sine and cosine, or e to the i uh, x, are fundamental things for linear motion or, or waves moving on a line, these functions, ylm, are the same kind of fundamental bedrock starting point for anything that has to do with waves on a sphere as opposed to waves just moving in a one-dimensional line. And the eigenfunctions of the operators l hat squared, the eigenvalue is l times l plus 1 times h bar squared, and simultaneous eigenfunctions of lz, and the eigenvalue there is m h bar. There are tables of these functions, but please, please, please do not ever try to memorize all the spherical harmonics. If we need them on an exam or you need them to do a problem, look them up. Don't try to memorize what they are. Understand where they came from, but don't try to commit to memory all the constants and whether it's minus plus or plus minus or, or what the exact trigonometric dependence is. If you understand where they came from, how they're normalized, and what they mean, and you can use them to actually do something, that's plenty. You don't need to commit them uh, to memory. And again, if you take a more advanced course, there are, in fact, neat ways to generate them. So you can generate um, these functions by taking derivatives of things, and you just start with one, and then you turn a handle, and you get the next one, and then you turn a handle, and you get the next one, and so forth. And, of course, knowing the generating function, as it's called, would obviate the need to memorize anything except the generating function, and for that you'd need to remember which generating function goes with which set of polynomials because, not surprisingly, there are generating functions for all kinds of polynomials, and that's, of course, um, how they're made. As we're going to see, the fact that this angular momentum is quantized, that it comes in steps, is very, very important when it comes to understanding atomic spectroscopy. And atomic spectroscopy is very important because the observation that atoms gave discrete energy lines of light and not just a continuum uh, was one of the crucial things that, that led physicists to believe that they didn't understand what was going on with atoms. They had no idea. They had <clears throat> the classical theory, the atom would spiral away, it could have any old energy, and then when they got these lines on film, they were discrete lines and they were always the same and they had to do with what kind of element you had, and that was ever so useful because that meant that you could find out what kind of element you had. And if you get a telescope and you look out as far as you can look, what you find out is that the whole visible universe seems to be made out of stuff on the periodic table. Uh, that may not see, seem surprising now, but that didn't have to be. It could be that if you look far enough away, that there's something that you don't understand. 
there's some chemistry occurring and some blast from some star left over that you don't understand. But when we look out, we see molecules that we see on Earth, we see hydrogen everywhere in the universe, we see all these beautiful lines and red glows from galaxies, and it all makes perfect sense because we can do the same experiments in the laboratory and see these lines. And so it seems like there's nothing um, mysterious about the stuff we can see. Now stuff we can't see, so-called dark matter, could be some different, different story altogether because if you have something that you really can't see at all or not very well, then um, it's very hard to figure out what it is because it's more or less invisible to you. The photon has one unit of angular momentum and it has an intrinsic twist and that's really important because when the photon comes into the atom, the photon is annihilated. The photon's here, the photon is gone. But the angular momentum we believe to be conserved, just like the energy. And therefore, it must be that the twist that was in the photon is converted into a twist in the wave function for the atom and vice versa. So when the atom emits a photon, a twist has to happen and the photon comes out. And that, that requirement that angular momentum be conserved along with energy really simplifies the atomic spectrum. Otherwise, we would have jillions of lines and it would be virtually impossible for us to figure out what was what. But because we only have a few and most of them are missing, it was possible for Rydberg to see the pattern in the energy levels. Um, therefore, if we have an atomic transition, as we're going to see when we talk about atomic spectroscopy in more detail, there is a selection rule. The selection rule is delta L, little l, from the spherical harmonics is equal to plus or minus one. In other words, the photon has to remove or absorb a twist and the atom has to compensate accordingly. There is another player in the game called spin. And it doesn't surprise us that if we've got a charged particle like an electron and it's in something that we understand to be on a ring or on a sphere that's moving around, circulating, that it looks like a current loop and it has a magnetic field. But experiments uh, that were done, more detailed experiments, in cases where the, uh, the atom should not have electrons moving around because it should basically be in this uh, constant state, this m equals zero, uh, kind of state that doesn't have any twist and can't have any angular momentum, uh, they still saw that there was some magnetic phenomenon. And the pivotal experiment, much like the photoelectric effect was the quantization of light and the Davison-Germer experiment showed that electrons could behave like waves, the Stern-Gerlach experiment showed that electrons themselves have an intrinsic magnetic field. Uh, in addition to charge and mass, electrons also behave on their own like a little bar magnet. And because we know that um, particles on a sphere and atoms, as we'll see, are quantized according to these equations with units of h-bar, uh, it would make sense that the electron would somehow be quantized. Now where would this um, magnetic field be coming from? Well, if we, if we blow up the electron and we have some kind of a planetary model for it as a uniform sphere of charge, then if the electron were spinning, then this uniform sphere of charge, if it were just spinning, and it, maybe it couldn't stop, um, would create a magnetic field because that would be a bunch of current loops. And unfortunately that kind of really concrete picture of the electron actually spinning um, can't possibly be true. And so rather than um, saying the electron 
is spinning, the dodge is to say the electron has spin. Rather than thinking of it as a mechanical thing actually occurring, it's now just a property like charge. It's something we give it a name and we, it's there and we can't quite explain it in terms of uh, a planetary model of a big blow up of the electron. But uh, as I mentioned before, the electron appears to have no size, so it would be difficult to figure out what size to assign for this um, planetary model anyway. Stern and Gerlach used a beam of silver atoms to do their experiment. And the reason why they did that is that uh, silver atoms have uh, a closed, basically a closed shell of electrons. And closed shell of electrons, when they're all filled up, the angular momentum is zero. That's one reason why closed shells are especially stable. And then there's one electron in an s orbital. And an s orbital has no orbital angular momentum. And, there, and the spin angular momentum, if there is any, for all the closed shell is also zero. That can be worked out. And therefore, we've got one electron in an outer shell, and we should just be able to use the silver atoms then to figure out what uh, value of the angular momentum this one electron has. Uh, that's why you pick silver. The other reason why you pick silver is that you can heat up silver in an oven in a vacuum, and you can get a beam of silver atoms. You can make silver vapor. You have to heat it up pretty hot, but you don't need a lot of atoms. And then you can send them through a detector, which I'll talk about in a second. And you can get silver stripes, just like making a mirror. And you can see whether you get the classical prediction or whether you get something else. Now, how do you actually interrogate on something as tiny as an atom what the magnetic uh, dipole moment, because remember this is like a little bar magnet. How are we going to do an experiment that gets us to, to get this thing to move? Well, if we stick a, uh, the, these magnets through a uniform magnetic field, nothing happens. They tend to reorient, um, but nothing happens to them. And so Stern and Gerlach used a magnetic field gradient, not a, not a uniform magnetic field. They had a beam of silver atoms, and then up and down they had a magnetic field gradient. It's not easy to think of what the magnetic field gradient does to a little bar magnet, because magnetism is a little bit more mysterious than just electrostatics. But it's basically the same as if I have an electric dipole in an electric field. And it turns out that a magnetic field gradient is going to put force on the little bar magnet and tend to accelerate it and deflect it. And which way it deflects can tell us whether the North Pole was up or whether the North Pole was down when it went through. As I said, it's much easier to see this in the case of um, an electric dipole and an electric field. And so I've drawn by analogy this situation where we have a capacitor, let's say, and it has uniform positive charge on one plate and uniform negative charge on another plate. And so we have the electric field lines going through at the edge. They have to bend. But let's say we're in the middle and they're going through nice and straight and we have a uniform electric field in space. If we have a dipole, which is always a negative charge hooked to a positive charge, and the dipole is like this, horizontal, in this electric field, it'll feel a torque because the positive charge will tend to get pulled toward the negative plate, and the negative charge will get turned toward the positive plate. And therefore, it'll tend to align, but it's not going to move anywhere because the total force on the thing from the positive charge and the negative charge, and they're hooked together, otherwise it wouldn't be a dipole, is zero. So it will tend to twist, but it won't tend to go anywhere. If it's going through, it'll twist 
and then stay going through. But now suppose I make the positive charge more concentrated on the top, say by shrinking the plate so that the field lines have to converge together. Then I get this um, picture shown on slide 302, where now, because there's more positive charge, even if it's aligned, let's say it's aligned with the negative on top, the positive on bottom, but there's more positive charge here nearer to the negative charge than there is negative charge on this more spread out plate to the positive charge. And therefore, these two will be pulled up along the field lines where the gradient is getting closer together. And that will put a force then on this thing, and if it were moving through, it would tend to deflect. Great. Now let's do the same thing uh, with the magnetic case. So let's take silver, let's make a beam out of an oven, individual silver atoms in a vacuum, of course, no air, or we'll just get silver oxide and the experiment will be off. Put them through some choppers. Why? Because we want to let only silver atoms with a certain velocity go through, put them through a small pipe, align them up so that we know that they're all going this way and they're all going at a certain speed, give or take, and then put them through a magnetic field gradient. And the silver is in the, uh, has this single electron in the 5s1 configuration. I'll talk about that uh, later when we talk about the electronic configurations of atoms in more detail. Uh, now, if the intrinsic bar magnet of the electron were a classical thing, it could just be pointing anywhere, I mean, why not, then we would expect to get just a spray of, of uh, possibilities if, depending how it was pointed in the magnetic field, it would get deflected up or down uh, to a certain maximum amount and then anywhere in between. But in fact, when they did the experiment, which I've sketched here out on slide 304, the classical prediction would be a smear. And when they did the experiment carefully, and when I say when they did it carefully, I believe historically when they first did it, they may not have had the beam um, narrow enough and going enough at the same speed. And of course, if you have things going through at different speeds, so they're in there for different times, and you don't have them aligned very much, then it's sort of like having a camera where you've deliberately blurred the image. Then you can't read anything. It just looks like it's all gray. You can't read the newsprint then. And I think the first time, or, or the, uh, initially, they got what seemed to be something that agreed with the classical result. But then when they did the experiment more carefully, they got two spots. So they get two spots. That means that um, M could be some positive thing or some negative thing. But the theory of angular momentum says that the difference between the levels should be integer. And the only way you can have two levels and not have three, not have one, zero, and minus one, and only have two levels would mean that it would have to be one half, which was really strange because that's hard, that's hard to see how, how the intrinsic angular momentum could be one half. But nevertheless, that's exactly uh, what was seen. We got two spots, and the conclusion then is that the electron magnetic moment is quantized. It corresponds to some kind of angular momentum that's intrinsic to the particle. We don't have a p detailed picture for it, but we know it's there. And the two allowed magnetic states, which we tend to call up and down, are just m sub s rather than m sub l. m sub s for spin, plus or minus one half. And it follows then that the spin angular momentum, which is just called s, like l, is just one half h bar. That's the uh, um, allowed value of the spin angular momentum. 
and there is no other solution. This is just an intrinsic property of the electron itself, it has nothing to do with anything except um, the intrinsic property of the electron. And it's very interesting then, this was puzzling as to how this could, could be like this, and next time I'll talk a little bit about spin and how important it has been, whether particles have a half integer spin or an integer spin um, because other particles like protons and deuterons and other things when they looked carefully and there were Nobel Prizes in those fields as well also had spin. They also had little magnetic moments and they were a half or sometimes they were a one. The electron's always a half and they separate into two groups, the halves and the not halves, the integers, and they have completely different properties in many kinds of experiments in physics and chemistry. The next time we'll pick it up from there and continue on our exposition of atoms.